This podcast on Jesus and the Apostles compares Jesus' preaching and the apostolic preaching and looks at uh, kind of an overview of how Christianity and its message is different than the message of other religions. In Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, we have the first mention of Jesus preaching. And it says that Jesus came into Galilee and he was preaching the good news. This is the word gospel, the word in the Greek euangelion, which literally means a good message. The good news that Jesus was preaching was clearly good news because it said that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom that people, Jews, had been looking for for a long, long time was finally at hand. That something that had been anticipated for hundreds of years was now at long last arrived. Jesus called upon people then to prepare themselves to enter into the kingdom of heaven by changing their mind, repent, that's the Greek word metanoia, to change their minds and change the way they thought about things so that they would be ready to really hear this good news and enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, believe the good news. This is where the whole idea of faith comes from as being so important in the Christian message. Faith is, first of all, about believing the good news that Jesus announced and then acting on it. When Jesus passed the ball to the apostles, which you can read about in Acts chapter 1 verses 1 through 11, he essentially said to the apostles, I'm going away now. And I'm going back to my father. I'm going back to the place I came from. And you're going to take over. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to be my witnesses. Now, this means that you're going to testify to other people about what you have seen and heard. And as my witnesses, you will be essentially telling the same story that I told, only you'll be telling it about me. And I want you to do that first in Jerusalem and then in Judea, which is the province surrounding Jerusalem, and then in Samaria, which uh, is the first taste of taking the gospel to some people who are not Jews, and ultimately to the very ends of the earth. In other words, to the whole Roman Empire. And this, of course, is exactly what happens in the book of Acts. What you have in the book of Acts is the apostles doing precisely this. Now, um, their initial reaction to this commission that Jesus had given them was, we can't do this. I mean, you know, you, you're, you're the great miracle-working God, but how are we going to do this? Jesus said, don't panic. I will send you the Holy Spirit, and you will receive the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will enable you then to do this work that I have given you to do. So the apostles did, in fact, receive the Holy Spirit. That story is told in Acts chapter 2. And then immediately they began to tell other people about what they themselves had experienced with Jesus. They uh, told the story of how Jesus was put to death on a Roman cross. They told the story about how Jesus was truly buried in the grave but then resurrected. And how his resurrection proves that he was who he said he was that if he had not been resurrected, he would have simply been one more crucified Jew, and there were already thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of those. But his resurrection proves that he was not just one more crucified Jew, that he was, in fact, who he claimed to be, God in human form. Therefore, the apostles said, you should believe him. You should believe this good news. You should trust him, and you should change your life and obey him. And that was essentially the content of the apostolic preaching during the entire first century. Now, one of the features of this apostolic preaching is its emphasis on the redemptive indicative. Now, you probably know what indicative is. An indicative sentence is simply a sentence that indicates some reality, like, uh, I went to the store, I sat down, my name is Dave. Um, A redemptive indicative indicates a redemptive reality. For example, Jesus saves. God has redeemed us. Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. We are forgiven in Christ and made clean and whole. The redemptive indicative tells us that we all need to be rescued, that Jesus did in fact come into this world and rescued us. If we will only allow him, he will in fact complete that rescue. 
And in order to do this, we need to repent, that is to say, change our mind about how we think about ourselves and about our need for rescue and about Jesus and about what he's done and about all of that stuff that goes along with it. We need to, in short, believe the good news, the gospel. Now, after the redemptive indicative comes another part part two of the message, and that's the ethical imperative. Now, you may know that an imperative sentence is a sentence that has a command in it. Go to the store, sit down, do your homework, feed the dog. Those are all imperatives. And um, an ethical imperative is about behavior. That's what ethics is all about, how one behaves. So an ethical imperative is, in a sense, a command to behave in a certain way. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't uh, commit adultery. Those are all ethical imperatives. The ethical imperative in the apostolic preaching is you now belong to God. You're God's own child. You bear Christ's name, and as a result, you need to live like it. So the first three statements, in a sense, are the redemptive indicatives. You now belong to God, you're God's own child, and you bear Christ's name. And out of it comes the ethical imperative, so live like it. All religions have essentially the same ethical imperatives. I mean, all religions teach, you know, don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat, and so on. There's very little difference. The idea here is that if you are good, then God or the gods will bless you and smile on you and be good to you, and ultimately you will get eternal life. And that will happen uh, in the opposite way if you're bad. If you're bad, the gods will punish you. If they don't do it in this life, then they will certainly do it in the next life. But Christianity is unique. Christianity says uniquely, no one is really good. We are all selfish. Therefore, we all deserve death. We all deserve condemnation and punishment. No one can get to heaven by being good. But God's blessing to us is a gift. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. It comes to us freely as a gift through Jesus Christ. So that in Christianity, the redemptive indicative precedes the ethical imperative. The redemptive indicative leads to the ethical imperative. Christianity says you are redeemed by a God who loves you more than you can ever imagine. Therefore, behave ethically in certain ways that will honor him and be good. Other religions say if you behave in certain ways and are good, then God will bless you. God will redeem you. God will love you. Notice how these compare side by side. Christianity, the redemptive indicative, precedes the ethical imperative. But in other religions, the ethical imperative precedes the redemptive indicative. Now, I might say all other religions make a lot of sense. You know, I mean, if you want to be blessed, then you need to be good. You need to deserve the blessing, right? You need to pay your tithe. You need to give your sacrifices. You need to keep your promises. You need to do whatever it is that you need to do in order to get God or the gods to bless you and give you ultimately redemption. Christianity is counterintuitive. Christianity says, look, God freely loves you, forgives you, and accepts you first before you have even taken a step towards him. He has let down the rope from heaven. He has sent Jesus down into the world to rescue you and redeem you. Therefore, behave in ways that are worthy of this great gift that God has bestowed upon you freely without your deserving it. The Acts of the Apostles describes not only the preaching of the message of Jesus, the gospel, the good news, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, what it means, and the call to believe it and accept it. It also describes how this whole thing spread through the, through the Roman Empire rather quickly. The Acts of the Apostles covers a period of maybe 50 years, and uh, it describes how the gospel Um, started, in fact, in Jerusalem, spread out, just as Jesus said it would, to Judea and Samaria, and ultimately to the uttermost parts of the earth, and how even Gentile Romans came to believe it and to be included in the grace of God. Then comes the epistles, 
the epistles of the New Testament, of course, are letters that were written by the apostles to churches and Christians in many different places in the Roman Empire. And these letters address a lot of different issues. Some of them are local, some of them are personal, some of them are global. We need to understand the setting of the epistles in order to be able to understand what they're saying and why they're saying it and what that means to us. And this is something that calls for some hermeneutic and also some careful exegesis. Most of the epistles remind Christians of the redemptive indicative that they have heard and that they have believed and how this has consequences for how they live their lives under the ethical imperative of Christianity. So it will say, you are new people now, so live like new people. You are God's children now, so live like God's children. You are entirely different from the inside out, so live like people who are entirely different. In summary, Jesus' preaching was the gospel, the good news of what God was going to do to rescue us. The apostles' preaching was the gospel, the good news of what God did do to rescue us. Hearing and believing the gospel changes us from the inside out, resulting in new behaviors. So the redemptive indicative of the gospel results in ethical imperatives that change and shape our lives and make us people who want more than anything in all the world to be like Jesus, to live like Jesus, to work like Jesus, to honor God, to please him, and to be the kind of people who make a difference in the world.